Now let's talk about the diagnostic tests for the cardiovascular and these are frequent you will see them in the hospital so they are important. Okay, let's start with the blood test or the serum test. The major thing that a uh, common thing that we would order that is specific to the heart usually is the cardiac markers or cardiac enzyme like CKMB, troponin, and globulin, myoglobin, and then an ANB and PNB. We'll talk about it. Now, every other, of course, other chemistry tests like, you know, potassium affects the heart, sodium affects the heart, but these are very specific to the heart. Start with CK, CKMB. A CKMB is, uh, you know, creatine kinase. This re is released in different area of the body. Now we have CKBB, CKMB. Um, now CKMB mainly the MB is specific to the muscles of the heart. So whenever there is an elevation of CKMB, that means there is a myocardial damage. So it's very specific. Now the difference between the different markers of the or biomarkers of the heart is like how long does it take for them to uh, peak or to elevate. So uh, it takes about after this the, the damage of the myocardium takes four to six hours for the CKMB to start to re to be elevated. So um, and then t it takes about a day to um, peak. So that's why CKMB it's sensitive, but it's not the best because it takes longer time to peak. Now normally the normal CKMB should be about five percent or low or less uh, than the total CKMB, so whatever, 5% so, uh, times um, 26 to 47. So this is a total CKMB, basically CK that comes from the brain, comes from the uh, uh, skeletal muscles, and from the uh, heart if there is any injury. So when we isolate it, that's how that reference that we follow. The other one is a troponin. A troponin, there we have three different types of troponin, but we only follow two in the hospital. So troponin is in between, as I told you in the previous video, is between the myocytes itself. So an elevation of troponin, and again, it's very sensitive and specific to the heart. That's why we follow, we use the troponin in the hospital mainly when there is a, we are when we suspect MI. So it is has a very high affinity or um, correlation to the myocytes. So that's why the most sensitive test for myocyte or myocardial infarction will be troponin. Okay, most sensitive one. And uh, these are the normal values that you follow, whether it's I or T, it should be low. Now, we when we suspect MI, we don't only use one uh, reading, we do three readings in the first 24 hours. So we do every eight hours. And if the troponin keeps giving up, going up, then that's that's how we can confirm that there's a myocyte. Plus, of course, other things. But again, it should be th three readings before we can say this is a positive MI. Now, myoglobulin, again, this is the, uh, it's an oxygen binding protein that we can see it, it's actually available in the myocytes of the heart as well as the skeletal muscle. Now, because it's also available in the skeletal muscles that make it insensitive, not necessary, not the, not specific to the heart. So, um, it's rarely used to, uh, in case of MI. The other type is peptides. We talked about them earlier, the ANB and the PNB. Whenever the ventricles or the atria, they stretch, they release these peptides to kind of, kind of uh, calling out for help and indication that there is a problem going on. Now, we rarely do our the ANP. We mainly concern about the ventricles and the PNP and the PNB. Always, this is the major indication for heart failure. Normally, it should be below 100 pg. Uh, per milliliter so um, the higher the number the worse the heart failure for chest x-ray we mainly are, we mainly look for um, the size and the location of the heart now this is a normal x-ray here and you can see the size of the heart and look at this size of the heart here so you can see this is what we call cardiomegaly when the heart size is increased and this is something you usually see in patient with heart failure So again, we're mainly looking for the size and the location of the heart. So it's mainly, it's not necessarily, it cannot confirm or diagnose a uh, serious problem, but it tells us that there are, um, whenever there's an anatomic change uh, in the heart. The other type, which we'll talk about more in details about it, is the um, X-ray, I'm sorry, ECG. We'll talk about it in details um, next week. But mainly ECG is the test for 
um, the electrical activity of the heart and it is a, it is a very very important test it is a non-invasive test it, it is non-invasive and it is um, mainly again for the electrical activity of the heart and um, again we'll talk about it next week no need for preparation and uh, other than we need to uh, take in, into consideration the medication that the patient is taking and as far as position and the technique we'll talk about it next week okay the other type that it is um, yeah we give it to some patients uh, now ECG is something we do over a minute or 30 seconds um, but if you want to see what's going on uh, on the heart rhythm throughout the day or days, then we give the patient a halter ECG. They wear them. They wear it at home, and um, it keeps a recording and also sending sometimes to the physician office any events or signals that the patient, the physician needs to be aware of. And uh, so this is something the patient can wear over a period of 24 hours. Again, usually we use it if we're changing medication for a patient or if we, give, if we put a pacemaker for a patient and we want to see how effective it is. Patient can just resume their daily activity. They just need to avoid anything that can affect the conductivity of this machine, like taking a shower or you know, doing a, um, a top bath. Um, and we can do it 24 hours or longer, and it looks like this. And this is the recording that we will look at. Okay, the other test is a cardiac cardiac test. Um, so this test basically is uh, for a patient who comes and complain of chest pain, and then when they arrive to the hospital, you know they they're fine. So uh, that means that they have cardiac events only under stress or under ex um, activities. So we do this kind of test to simulate simulate the uh, dilation of coronary arteries whenever there's a need uh, like an emotional stress or physical stress so we have the patients mainly a treadmill we connect them to a 12 lead ECG we have a continuous um, recording of ECG as you see here and um, the patient should be comfortable wearing a non-strict uh, clothes in a tennis shoes and then you of course the the nurse or who's ever doing the procedure should be there with the patient okay now as far as the preparation for this test um, again this is a non-invasive test and um, we mainly using a treadmill and um, if the patient is unable to walk or to run then we can do the same idea of simulation by giving a medication like um, uh, most commonly we give persantin or dobutamine IV this medication creates a stress on the heart and then again we connect the patient to the monitor and this way we'll see how will the heart will the heart react in this kind of situation so again it's a simulation of the uh, stress and uh, in order to see how the heart will respond so the patient has MI or angina it will show here now again we need a consent especially if there is um, if we have to use the IV option a patient needs to have ad adequate rest uh, so we want to avoid anything that can um, bias the result the patient can eat just uh, a s small and uh, light meal before we want to avoid any thing and activity that can increase the stress on the heart again we don't know how to bias the results so no smoking no alcohol the night before if the patient's taking medication for a heart like car, uh, calcium channel blockers or beta blockers we need to hold them for 24 hours of course and the patient needs to be comfortable and it's important to know that the, the nurse or the who they're doing the procedure must stop whenever the patient start to show symptoms of angina if patients become dizzy or shortness of breath or um, ha start to have chest pain definitely you need to quit the procedure right away now how far do we go we have a specific time to it but there's also an equation we'll talk about that more in critical care there's an equation out based on the age of the patient we have a cutoff point so you will keep the test going until the patient gets to this heart rate so um, let's say this number is 180 if the patient gets to 180 and he's fine that means that um, the stress is, is is negative we and the patient will be fine if they ever have any events where that requires more stress but if the patient start to have chest pain before we get to that point that we decide based on the age of the patient 
that means that the patient is probably having angina and then we have to consider treating the patient. Um, after the procedure again uh, the patient just need to, to rest and avoid any activities that can decrease the blood pressure mainly like taking a shower or you know especially hot shower because the patient probably will be dizzy and, and tired anyway. The other type is the echocardiogram. This is an uninvasive test again and it, it's used the ultrasound. It used the ultrasound technique and it's a great and you see this is uh, can be done at the bedside. The patient needs just to sit still and to be it's better to be in the left side. When a patient is in the left side that will increase the venous return. So if there's any murmur or any structure problem in the valves um, that increase of venous return will, will show it. That's why we need we uh, have the patient in this in this position. Again, this is an uninvasive procedure, and um, the uh, again using the ultrasound. It is uh, it is the test of choice for uh, if you want to see any if there's any destruction of valves again and our size of the heart and it's mainly again the ejection fraction which is the amount of a blood that leaves the heart or the percentage, the percentage of the blood that leaves the heart with every beat. And this is normally between 50 to 70 percent. And it's low in case of cardio of heart failure. This is uh, in st especially systolic heart failure. We'll talk about that in heart failure, but remember that ejection fraction is measured by the uh, echocardiogram. The other type is, uh, the other procedure is uh, the uh, uh, cardiac uh, um, catheterization. This is uh, one of the most serious test it's invasive so basically through a vein or artery we insert a catheter that goes to image to um, in order to visualize the heart and the great muscles that surrounding the heart so it can test the structure and the performance of the heart now there are uh, since this is an invasive procedure will be more uh, preparation that we need to do before the patient can go first of all we need definitely to get the consent from the patient also always check if the patient has iodine uh, so we ask the patient if they have allergy to seafood or shellfish and because um, that's uh, this dye is mainly made with that now as you see in this picture this is a patient who developed allergy after they received the dye they did not know they had allergy so if we know if the patient has allergy we give them antihistamine before they go many physicians will give the antihistamine anyway because if you're not sure about the allergy it's better just to give the antihistamine before um, the um, other preparation is uh, a patient need to be NPO before the procedure from 6 to 8 hours and again any procedure that involves uh, local anesthesia or involves uh, conscious anesthesia involves basically putting the patient to sleep and the patient should be about 8 hours before the procedure, it be NPO before the procedure. Always we need to have a baseline before the patient goes as far as vital signs and preferred pulse because these are the major the area that will be affected and that's because we want to comport when the patient comes. Now you need to teach your patient that um, as far as pain that it's going to be only local anesthesia in the area wherever the um, catheter will be inserted so the area will be numb, the patient shouldn't feel the pain. And uh, it is important to teach your patient that they may feel fatigued afterward. Uh, again, this is a complicated, it's not a complication, but uh, because of the anesthesia, but also prepare the patient that this procedure may take up to two hours and that they're going to be stay, laying on their back on the bed, on uh, yeah, the table and the catheter. Also, as soon as the catheter touches the structure of the heart, the, it may cause a flatter, a flatter. So ask, prepare your patient that this is a normal feeling or expected feeling that they may hear. And after the injection of the dye, the patient may, feel, may have that warm feeling and flushed feeling. Now, this dye is, is, uh, can be uh, um, very toxic to the kidneys. So any, any other factors that can affect the kidneys, uh, function we want to eliminate. So for example, metformin or glucophage, which is a medication that's used for diabetes, is an oral, the oral antihyperglycemic. This should be withhold 24, 48 hours before the procedure, assuming that the procedure is elective. Sometimes we have to take the patient to the cardiac cath. It's an urgent one, not elective. But um, if it's elective, we need to stop that uh, glu um, glucophage because the glucophage can cause renal failure in case of 
uh, the dye also com there's a combination also the area should be shaved and always use uh, electrical shaving not the the sharp one especially for a patient with high density to bleed so after the, pr the patient comes back from surgery or sorry from the cardiac cath definitely the mon monitoring and you have to monitor the patient for the first two hours every third minutes 30 minutes and we're looking for vital signs dysrhythmia and definitely the peripheral pulses any if you find if the patient's complaint of chest pain any any complaint any signs and symptoms that can correlate to um, complication cardiac cath complication you must notify these are medical emergency go ahead and notify whether dysrhythmia or chest pain and definitely peripheral pulses at the pulses below the area of insertion must be um, assist and if you don't feel the pulse and if you have other symptoms that indicate that there's a blockage like no pulse and then the temperature is it's cold especially if you use artery then this is also a medical emergency it has you have to inform the physician right away a uh, patient has any numbness or tingling also these are indication of blockage uh, the great again another important thing is that we have to put uh, to apply pressure and now we have different type of pressure that we apply but the most common thing that you may see in the hospital is using a sandbag with about five pounds over the area of insertion okay and then patient needs to maintain his leg straight he cannot bend his leg for about six hours and this area you need to monitor for bleeding because bleeding mainly hematoma if there's any hematoma you have to inform the physician right away Okay, so this is an old hematoma for a patient after cardiac cath. Okay, the leg should not, must not be injured. Now you can change the position of your patient as long as their legs are, are uh, straight. Even if they need to move to the side, as long as the leg, the affected leg is straight. The patient can bend the other one. Now you don't ever bend the head of the patient or don't do anything that will lead that to extend or to bend the leg or the affected leg. Another very important thing is encouraging the patient to have for fluid intake, okay? Because we need to get rid of this dye as soon as possible. So sometimes we give the patient IV hydration even before, after, and during, especially with patients with the renal insufficiency already. So encourage your patient to drink as, many flu as much fluid as possible just to flush this die out and again if the patient has any um, sign of allergies it must be reported metformin uh, we have to test the blood the uh, kidney function after the die uh, at least six hours or the next day and then based on that we'll decide if we should resume the metformin or not usually we hold it for 48 hours now another important thing to remember if you hold a medication like metformin you know that the blood sugar will be affected so we are holding it just because of the kidney function so meanwhile if the patients come uh, start to have hyperglycemia we can use insulin just temporarily just to control the blood pressure and then the last thing i want to talk about is the cardiac angiogram pretty much like the cardiac catheterization but here we are we're, we're using combination of things we do an x-ray we do a CT scan and also we do a fluoroscopy and mainly and of course we put a dye and what we are looking for is to see the to visualize the blood circulation the blood vessel to see if there's any blockage or any clot in any of the area as far as the procedure the before and after is pretty much the same and uh, in the same thing if after the procedure so this is an angiogram for example um, so basically we injected the dye which will get mixed with the blood and the blood circulate as you see here but you can see this area is is narrow and that means there's a blockage here or a partial occlusion